1 through 48. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> While they were wondering about this, suddenly, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how, remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified on the third day, be, be raised again. <coughs> they remembered his words. <coughs> when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. <coughs> Bending over, he saw the straps of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. I love this part. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they did not recognize him. But they, kept, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleophas, asked him, are you only a visitor in Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, asked Jesus, what, what things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, <coughs> powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. They crucified him. But, when we, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. <coughs> and what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who, who said he was alive. Some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish are you, how slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly. Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and open the scriptures to us. <coughs> they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them 
when he broke when he broke the bread. <clears throat> While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, "Peace be with you." They were startled and fright and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, "Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet. It is I myself." Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe, did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of raw fish and took it, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. May the Lord have a blessing for the reading and the hearing of his word. Amen. Thank you so much, Maurice. We now have an opportunity to extend our worship as we give back to our Heavenly Father just a portion of what he has so richly blessed us with as we call our ushers forward to receive his tithes and offerings.
this day. We ask that you please bless, uh, bless these gifts, Lord God, and bless each and every giver. And we do owe it all to you, Lord God. We ask that you just guide us as we learn more about your Son, in Jesus' name. Please be seated. events taking place during the week. I know many of you are off from school and possibly from work as well. Good for you. Uh, your Connections newsletters in your mailboxes today. Uh, extra copies are in the Welcome Center if uh, you'd like to share them with someone. Uh, the church office will be closed on Monday. And the yard sale will be held April 23rd. Now what's the change of day? Rain date is the 30th. It's the 30th, not the 20th. Oh, okay. So the rain day will be on the 23rd. And there will be a charge of 10 bucks uh, per table for those that, uh, that will be participating. Uh, Operation Christmas Child has been collecting plastic cups, socks, and t-shirts in March. In April, they will be collecting small toys, and there will be a receptacle in the lobby for those things to be collected. And movers for moms and the NA group that meets in our church are collecting things for Shepherd's Place. A list of items needed in, or is in the newsletter, so be sure to check it out and make sure you look at your newsletter for all the other items that are taking place in the life of our church. And I don't think I have anything else. Nope, brother. is found in the book of Colossians, starting with chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, and continuing to chapter 3, verses 5 and 10. So then, just as you have received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to serve your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. And then in Colossians 3, 5 to 10, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all <coughs> such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie, do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old selves with its practices and have put on a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. I think. Good morning, church, and happy Easter. I'm Pastor Jeff Collins, and uh, it's good to be with you this morning. Glad you're here today. <coughs> There's a lawyer in New Orleans, I'm sorry, New Orleans, that sought a federal housing authority loan for a client. And he was told the loan would be granted if he could prove satisfactory title to a parcel of property that he offered as collateral. The title to the property dated back to 1803, which took the lawyer three months to track down. And after sending all that information to the FHA, he received the following letter as a reply. They wrote, Upon review of your letter adjoining your client's application for a loan, we note that the request is supported by an abstract of title. While we compliment the able manner in which you have prepared and presented the application, we must point out that you have only cleared the title to the proposed collateral back to 1803. Before final approval can be accorded, it will be necessary to clear the title back to its origin. 
Well, that was really annoying. And so the lawyer responded as follows. Your letter regarding title in case number 189156 has been received. I note that you wish to have the title extended further than the 194 years covered by the present application. I was unaware that any educated person in this country, particularly those working in the property area, would not know that Louisiana was purchased by the United States from France in 1803, the year of origin identified in our application. For the edification of uninformed FHA bureaucrats, the title to the land prior to U.S. ownership was obtained from France, which acquired it by right of conquest from Spain. The land came into possession of Spain by right of discovery, made in the year 1492 by a sea captain you may remember named Christopher Columbus, who had been granted the privilege of seeking a new route to India by the then reigning monarch Isabella, the good queen, being a pious woman and careful about titles almost as much as the FHA, took the precaution of securing the blessing of the Pope before she sold her jewels to fund Columbus's expedition. Now the Pope, as I'm sure you know, is the emissary of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And God, it is commonly accepted, created this world. Therefore, I believe it's safe to presume that he also made that part of the world known as Louisiana. He, therefore, would be the owner of origin. I hope you find his original claim to be satisfactory. Now, may we have our loan? Well, that lawyer had to go through an awful lot of red, red tape to make a case for a claim on a piece of land. He traced the claim back to what he considered to be the highest claim that could be made on a piece of land. Well, this letter is actually an urban myth that you've probably read in your emails at one time or another. But today I want to ask you about a different kind of a claim. I want to ask you, who has claim on your life? Not just a title, not just a paperwork, not just lip service, but who really has claim on your life? Let's talk about that. But before we do, let's pray. Father, your word tells us that the gospel is not about words, but about power and the Holy Spirit. Send that Holy Spirit among us now. Hold us close in the power of your love and let us feel your grip on our hearts today. Open your word to us. Your word is living and active. It's not just print on a page or distant history, but actively speaking and closer than breathing. Let us breathe it in that we might find life there. For we pray in the life-giving, precious, and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, today's Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. For a whole lot of people, that's simply a day to make their annual pilgrimage to church and hear about how Jesus died and was raised from the dead. They'll hear the church celebrate that Jesus is alive, and then they'll go home unchanged, or perhaps inoculated with enough religion to feel like they've done their time and can get on with their lives unencum unencumbered and unattached to any church or faith obligations. They can be satisfied with being good people, or at least better than a lot of people they know. And they can enjoy, or perhaps endure, a big dinner with their family, depending on the family, and go on as if nothing ever happened. In the days ahead, they'll continue to struggle with life's trials, wondering if this is all there is to life. They'll keep trying to push aside the emptiness that they feel inside, the nagging longing that expects something great and wonderful, but it never happens. They'll medicate it, hide it, Try to ignore it. They'll, they'll look at all the familiar places hoping to fill that void. TV, movies, entertainment, social media, pornography, sex, money, power, fame, technology, gadgets, status, drugs. These all promise abundant life. Somehow they never deliver. They always leave us 
feeling empty. That gnawing despair is still there. A sense of a failed potential, of, of missing out, of being on the outside, of emptiness, of meaninglessness. Louis Pascal was a scientist, but he once described that, that inner void as a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. But our culture has told us that only stu stupid people believe in God anymore. So, obviously we can't look there. And if we can't look there, then we will still continue searching in vain. Because the longing remains. If we want to find life, if we want to find what fills that void, we have to be not only open to what God has done in history, but open to what God can do in our lives right now, today. Look around you. As you look around, you will see people who have opened their lives to God's presence and been changed by it. You can't argue with them. You'll never convince them that they're wrong because they know what they've experienced, even if they can't fully explain it. Right now, in places like Syria and Iraq, Christians face people who have proven that they will kill them, rape them, torture them, behead them, unless they <laughs> deny Christ. <clears throat> but they choose death rather than let go of the hope that they have in Christ because they know that it's real. They are certain. They know that it's eternal. They found the truth and the truth has set them free and they will not let go. They filled that void and nothing else will keep them away. You see, the message of Easter goes far beyond a cross of death or, or an empty tomb. It points to a Savior who lives and who still changes lives, offering eternal life and forgiveness to all who come to Him, even today. This past week, one of my praise team members asked me if there was anything special happening on Easter Sunday. I admitted that other than the sunrise service, we were having worship times as usual, regular times. There are no gimmicks planned today. No hype. No trumpets and fanfare. Fair, no no uh, moving videos. There'll be no altar call. I think that unbelie unbelievers have come to view the altar call as cliche, and they mock it as such. Besides, we had several events at the high schools this week where an altar call was given. I saw people go forward laughing, fooling around. They didn't take it seriously at all, it seems. So forget the gimmicks. Forget the splash. We just need to know what's true. And we need to know if it'll make a difference for us in our lives. Am I right? Easter Sunday is supposed to focus on the resurrection of Jesus. After being tortured, mocked, and crucified, Jesus Christ died and was buried. But after three days, he rose from the dead. That's what the Bible claims. That's what the church claims. And we know it's true. You heard the story read for you this morning. You probably never stopped to think about whether it really happened or not. It doesn't matter to you. You've never made the connection between that story and the story of your life. You've never seen the impact, impact that that might have on you. Now think about this. Technically, if Jesus overcame death, rose from the dead, and he didn't die again, <clears throat> what does that mean? Doesn't that mean that he's still alive 2,000 years later? Jesus Christ would still be alive if any of this is true. But so what? What does that mean to us? Today, how can that affect my life and, and that gut-wrenching struggle of my soul for meaning and value and purpose that I contend with daily? Let me help you make that connection. You see, long ago, God intervened in history by sending His Son, Jesus, into the world to save the world through Him. 
The life of Jesus is indisputable fact. Historians have recorded it. There's more, there's more proof for the life of Jesus and his death than there are for, for anything else in, ancient, in the ancient world. <coughs> but who was he? What was his purpose? Jesus told us that God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Are, are you part of the world? Then God loved you too. Jesus wasn't just some random teacher. He was the son of God. He was sent into the world for a purpose, to save the world. More than that, to save you. That's right, to redeem you from the power of sin which has wrecked your life and created a void within you and to give you eternal life. Life that starts the moment you give yourself over to following Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But what is this eternal life? Will it fill the void? Is there an ongoing connection between eternal life from Jesus and my life as it stands? Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Or have it abundantly, an abundant life. Is that possible? Is it possible that Jesus may be able to fill the void in our lives? Is it possible that he may be able to fill us abundantly? Is it possible that what we're really longing for is a right relationship with God? And if so, can it happen? Well, first of all, I want you to know you can't force it. You can't make it happen. You couldn't track God down and demand answers. How would you find God? If he didn't want to be found, you couldn't find him. But Easter reminds us about some good news. You see, it's not about our search for God. It's about God's search for us. He came after you. He is looking for you. He is searching for you. He did that in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, God has a longing too, a yearning inside because he loves you. He really loves you. And he longs to have you with him for eternity. He longs to share his love with you and to enjoy your love for him. Now, does that surprise you? It's what he keeps saying to you, but you never hear it. It's what you keep hearing, but you just can't seem to accept it. It's what you've been longing for, but you aren't sure whether you can receive it. <clears throat> if you accept God's love for you, and that you need His love, that you're needy, will that make you somehow seem weak? <clears throat> will it somehow take you down a notch? Will it ruin your reputation? Hey folks, I've got news for you. You are weak, just like the rest of us. Weak, needy, dependent, lost, hurting, desperate, sick, wretched, poor. And until we're willing to admit that and take the chance on losing everything, we're not ready to accept what God has for us and to follow Christ. You're not ready to gain everything. Listen to what Jesus said about anybody who would follow him. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? <clears throat> to gain the whole world. Isn't that what we're trying to do when we try to look good for the world? When we're trying to gain the whole world. The world is our oyster. We want to be on top of the world. But to gain all that and yet lose our soul. What good is that? The gain is only temporary. It's not lasting. If you would have life, if you would gain life, you must lose self. 
If you would gain eternity, you must deny self. Admit your wretched condition. Embrace that inner emptiness and allow God to fill it. That condition comes from the fact that you've been trying to do it your own way. You haven't been willing to admit that your way doesn't work. Is it working? Your way is wrong. Your way is the opposite of God's way. And until you're willing to let go of your way and accept God's way, you'll never know life and joy and peace. That's why Paul tells us in his letter, what Bob wrote, read, read for us earlier, he says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now, now, something is different now. Now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other. Since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. You know, if anybody could say that they had something in life, it was Paul who wrote these words. Paul who was a, a Pharisee, who was, who was one of the important people, one of the in crowd, you know, one of the upper echelon. But when Christ comes, when Christ comes into Paul's life, everything changes. He gives that all up, and instead of being the in crowd, he becomes persecuted. He becomes the, the reject. He's often beaten and stoned and shipwrecked. He goes through all sorts of things as a, as a Christian that he didn't before. He gave that all up, and this is what Paul says about that. He says, I consider everything that I had rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Savior. Everything else that I thought and that the world told me was, was what would give me life, that was trash. It was garbage. I found something real in Christ, he says. Impurity, sexual immorality, lost evil desires and greed, Paul says, are idolatry. The things that you've adopted and counted on to make you happy are just idols. They're false gods. We think of idols, we think of little statues. They're more than that. They're things in which you set your hope and your desires. They can be drugs, greed, sex, the desire for fame, even success. But if you're going to put those things to death and live for Christ, it begins with a commitment, a commitment to follow Jesus. And it's not a one-time decision. It's a life commitment. It's a daily determination. It's a moment by moment, surrender to the will of God. It's not a religious pill that you, that you take in a moment when you're caught up in an emotional or pressurized decision, a deter but it's a determination to live for God from this moment on. So today you will hear no hype from me, no noisy music, no pressure to buy now. There are too many people in the world who call themselves Christians because they went forward to an altar. And they haven't done anything since the day of that altar call. Nothing to get their life in line with following Jesus. There are too many people who decided to accept eternal life without committing to live that eternal, eternal life as Jesus defines it. They still want to define it for themselves. They'll still do it my way. And that means itself is still on the throne of their life. That throne belongs to Jesus and Him alone. If we're going to follow Him, we give Him all the authority in our life. No hype, no gimmicks, no dim lights, no emotional stories. I didn't even do my usual PowerPoint this morning with pictures. Just the knowledge of what Easter is all about and an invitation to make the decision to live out the truth of Easter every day of our lives. Jesus is alive. They killed Him. Yes, they made sure that he was dead. After he took his last breath, they stuck a spear in his side and through his heart to make sure, to make certain that he was dead because that was their job. And they did it well. He was killed and then laid in a tomb. The tomb was sealed. But Jesus is Lord. 
Jesus is the Word that was with God, and through Him all things were created. Jesus is life. The grave could not hold the author of life. On that Easter morning, Jesus rose from the dead and He is here in this place. He is alive. He sent His Spirit to live in the hearts of all who will follow Him. He lives in me and He will live in you if you let Him. You have to decide that you'll do that. The decision is entirely yours. Know that we're here for you. If you decide to follow Jesus, you need people to help you do that. You need to learn what it means to walk with Christ. You need to learn His ways, because His ways are not our ways. And we continue to learn and grow for the rest of our lives and into eternity. That's what makes it a wonderful adventure. And we want to help you with that, if and when you're ready. Someone once complained to Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was an exceptional preacher from the 20th century. They complained that the night before at an uh, event that he had led, that he had given a powerful sermon, but that he, he didn't give an altar call. The men said to him, well, if you had given an altar call last night, I would have come forward. And Martin Lloyd-Jones said to him, if you had come forward last night but wouldn't still come forward this morning, you're not ready to give your life to Christ. It's not about an altar call. It's not about doing the gimmicks. I agree with Martin Lloyd-Jones. I am tired of one-time decision Christians. I'm tired of Christians who have one year of experience that they repeat over and over for decades and never grow beyond the basics. I'm tired of Christians who remain babies in the faith and for their whole lives, they still have to be spoon-fed or even bottle-fed because they've never learned to feed themselves. God forbid that they would go ahead and feed others as they're called to do. I'm tired of people who call themselves Christians, but who have never surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. Such people give Jesus a bad name, and I don't want to encourage that. We don't honor God by showing up at church on Easter or, Christ or Christmas and Ignoring him the rest of the year. Or even by showing up at church every week and ignoring him during the week. Christians aren't those who see church as a duty or an obligation. Christians are those who have entered into a dynamic relationship with a Lord who loves them so much that he died for them and came back to life. And they are so in love with Him that they can't get enough of following Him, of serving Him, of giving themselves to Him, or of being with Him, or being among His people. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. It's not about history. It's about His coming to be part of our story and the main part of our story. Jesus, the living one, says this. He says this to each one of us. Here I am, I stand at the door of your heart, and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. God is in pursuit of you right now, standing at the door of your life, saying, let me in. I want to be a part of your life. I want to give you life. I want to give you what life is all about. I want to help you to fulfill what I intended for you in this life. Jesus says, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me as a scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Streams of living water, Jesus was referring to the Holy Spirit that I said he gives to live in the hearts of everyone who surrenders their life to him. The Holy Spirit who lives in me and many of you and can live in all of you. Will you drink of that living water? Will you follow the one who died for you and rose from the dead? Will you invite him into your life? This morning is Easter. And you are invited to enter the kingdom of God. And find a life in the one who died for your sins so that you might have eternal life. He is risen. He is alive. You can Know Him. Will you follow Him? Lord, I'm tired of ritual religion. Too many people hide behind it and think that they're good. I'm weary of programs that entertain people and make them think they're doing something for you. 
I long for your Holy Spirit working in the hearts of people who are simply bursting with a desire to serve you and to tell of your goodness to others. I yearn for the power of your Spirit that changes not only individual lives, but whole families and whole communities. Come into our hearts and lives today. Touch us and empower us to live in you and for you and to let your living water flow from within us. Fill us. Walk with us. Teach us. Guide us. Direct us. You are the living one. And we would follow you with everything that is in us. That's my prayer today for each one. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>